when the clock has started. Yes, sir. Reading it loud and clear. Roger roll, Discovery. Discovery, Roger, very proud Thank you, Andrew, and welcome to the May 8th, 2019 edition of Space News. This is Michael Abdilla, and I have Tina Stagg and Angela de Grazia here with me tonight from the Space Association of Australia. Let's start in New Zealand. Rocket Lab deploys experimental US military small sats on its first night launch. Rocket Lab's Electron launched last Sunday afternoon from New Zealand with a trio of small US military payloads demonstrating the privately developed rocket's ability to help meet the Air Force's growing demand for small sat launches. This was Electron's first nighttime launch and its first launch for the US Air Force. The rocket carried three small satellites ranging in size from a tissue box to a small refrigerator for the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command. Rocket Lab intended to launch the mission a day before, but officials delayed the launch to conduct additional checks on the payloads. The mission's total payload weight, around 180 kilograms, made it the heaviest launch by Rocket Lab to date. Rocket Lab charges less than $7 million for its launches and Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1, which has not yet flown and will drop from an airborne carrier jet, sells for approximately $12 million per flight, making the Electron rocket very competitive in the small SAT market. OK, Tina, over to you. Thanks, Michael, and good evening, space fans. Turning to NASA and the SLS Orion program... NASA will retain a key test of the space launch system despite its schedule impact. NASA officials said in an internal memo recently that they will keep the green run test where the SLS core stage conducts an eight-minute static fire test on a test stand at the Stennis Space Centre. The agency suggested last month that the test could be skipped, cutting as much as six months from the development schedule for the vehicle. Some, including the agency's Independent Safety Board, warned against skipping the Green Run test, as reported on last week's Space News. Turning to NASA's Moon program, the agency is providing more details about how it thinks it can achieve a human lunar landing by 2024, but the budget remains uncertain. In a presentation last week, Bill Gerstenmayer, NASA Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, said he envisioned astronauts going to the moon on exploration mission EM3 after the uncrewed EM1 test flight of the SLS and Orion in late 2020 or 21 and the crewed EM2 test in 2022. That approach will likely include a minimal lunar gateway, as well as landing systems to be developed by industry in an upcoming procurement. It didn't give an estimated budget for carrying out that approach, and other officials said a revised budget request is still under development. Later that same day, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine told Senators that the agency will need a surge of funding to achieve a human lunar landing in 2024, but not as much as previously rumoured in the mainstream and social media. Testifying before a Senate Appropriations Subcommittee, Bridenstine said NASA was still working with the National Space Council and the Office of Management and Budget on a revised budget request with additional funding to meet the goal of landing humans on the moon in 2024. However, he said reports that NASA was seeking an additional $8 billion a year for five years were inaccurate, as NASA was seeking nowhere close to that amount. Turning to NASA's commercial crew program and addressing the Crew Dragon anomaly that destroyed the spacecraft on April 20, Bridenstine once again defended NASA's approach to the subcommittee of working side-by-side with SpaceX in the investigation of the Crew Dragon anomaly rather than conduct its own independent investigation. Further, SpaceX said last week that it has yet to identify the root cause of the Crew Dragon anomaly. At a pre-launch news conference for the Cargo Dragon mission, SpaceX Vice President Hans Koenigsman said the anomaly took place during the activation of the Super Draco thrusters on the spacecraft a half second before they were to ignite in a static fire test. 
The problem, he said, did not appear to be with the thrusters themselves and he also said it was not likely linked to composite overwrapped pressure vessels in the spacecraft, which are of a different design from those on the Falcon 9 rocket. At the briefing, NASA said it concluded there was no risk to flying the cargo version of Dragon on upcoming space station missions because of a lack of commonality with Crew Dragon. Meanwhile, NASA contractors at the Kennedy Space Center were reminded of restrictions on distributing photos and video after the Crew Dragon incident. A memo sent to workers who are part of the test and operations support contract at the center reminded them of existing prohibitions on sharing images of activities at the centre, saying they could be fired for doing so. The memo came after a leaked video showed the Crew Dragon spacecraft being enveloped in a fireball in the test mishap, imagery which was not officially released by either NASA or SpaceX. And to Angelo. OK, thanks, Tina. Let's uh, turn to NASA's planetary and space science missions. A new heat shield for NASA's Mars 2020 mission has passed a key test. Lockheed Martin said last week that the heat shield completed tests that confirmed its structural integrity, including one where it was subjected to 120% of the expected loads it will experience upon the entry into the Martian atmosphere. A different heat shield built for the mission cracked during similar tests last year. As NASA's administrator expressed support for the agency's planetary defence work, scientists advocated for additional missions. Speaking at a planetary defence conference last week, Jim Bridenstine said the agency was committed to continuing work to discover near-Earth objects and study ways to mitigate any threats they pose to the planet. Attendees sought to win support for additional missions like the NEOCAM space-based observatory, but Bridenstine would only say he'd consider such missions in the future. Bridenstine also used his speech to discuss NASA's exploration plans, including the importance of the space launch system in implementing them. Replacing an instrument on NASA's Europa Clipper mission could adversely affect some of its planned science. NASA announced last month that it was replacing a magnetometer instrument called IceMag on the spacecraft with a less expensive but also less capable alternative after IceMag suffered cost growth. At a meeting recently, scientists said the new magnetometer could make it more difficult to accurately measure the thickness of the ice sheet and depth and salinity of the subsurface ocean on the moon of Jupiter. The mission is on track for a launch now scheduled for 2023 as the program considers an alternative trajectory that makes use of a Falcon Heavy launch should an SLS be unavailable for the mission. A debate between the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee on a planned launch procurement is escalating. Representative Adam Smith, Democrat Washington, Chairman of the Committee, asked Secretary of the Air Force Heather Wilson last month, to postpone the launch service procurement. Smith argued the move to select two providers by 2020 is being rushed. This is incidentally what Jeff Bezos from Blue Origin had also been arguing. Wilson responded recently by saying any delay would prevent the Air Force from fulfilling a congressional mandate to end use of the Russian-built RD-180s engines that power the Atlas V. Smith is said to be unsatisfied with Wilson's response and is weighing up what steps to take next, according to a committee official. Some in the industry are also concerned that the upcoming procurement will allow companies to offer an alternative launch vehicle as a backup if the primary vehicle is not ready by 2022, rather than recompeting the contract, a provision that would appear to favour, guess who, United Launch Alliance and their Vulcan rocket over other contenders. Okay, to Michael. Thanks, Angelo. Let's move to China. China is moving ahead with plans to conduct a rocket launch at sea. Along March 11, a small, solid fuel rocket will launch from a ship in the Yellow Sea in the middle of this year. The payload was not disclosed, but the rocket will be named CZ-11 Wei under an agreement between the China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology, China Space Foundation and a Chinese automobile producer. 
Launching from sea, Chinese officials said, avoids the problem of spent stages falling on land and could lower launch costs. Now on to India. India's space agency ISRO confirmed last week that it has delayed the launch of its next lunar mission to July. ISRO said the Chandrayaan-2 mission is now scheduled for launch between July 9 and 16, which would allow the spacecraft to land on the moon on September 6. ISRO had previously planned to launch the mission in March or April, but missed that date because work on the spacecraft, which includes an orbiter and a lander, took longer than expected. The July launch window is the next favourable opportunity to launch the mission, the agency said. And moving to Japan. The Japanese government plans to determine what role it will play in NASA's Lunar Gateway by the end of this year. Masahiko Shibiyama, the government's science minister, said the decision would come after internal deliberations that will take into account developments in the US, such as accelerating the timeline for a human lunar landing. He met last week with NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein, where the two signed a letter of intent for cooperation on the Lunar Gateway. OK, back to you, Angelo. OK, let's talk SpaceX. The FCC granted permission to SpaceX last week to fly some of its Starlink satellites in lower orbits. The FCC granted a request to place 1,600 satellites, yes, you heard that right, 1,600, in orbits just 550 kilometres high, instead of the originally planned altitude of 1,150 kilometres. SpaceX argued the lower altitude would be beneficial to the space environment, since the spacecraft would deorbit naturally in just five years, even if the company didn't make any effort to deliberately deorbit them at the end of their lives and will also reduce signal latencies. The FCC rejected opposition to the move by OneWeb and Kepler Communications, who argued the lower orbits could result in KU band interference. The first 60 Starlink satellites are due to launch aboard the Starlink 1 mission on a SpaceX Falcon 9 B5 Block 5 later this month. Falcon 9 launches a Dragon cargo spacecraft to the International Space Station. SpaceX launched CRS-17 Dragon cargo spacecraft to the International Space Station last weekend. The Falcon 9 Block 5 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, placing the Dragon into orbit nearly 10 minutes later. The rocket's first stage made a successful landing on the drone ship, of course I still love you, close offshore. The launch previously scheduled for May 3rd was scrubbed because of an electrical problem with SpaceX's drone ship and before that was scheduled for May 1st but delayed because of a separate electrical problem on the International Space Station. Keeping with commercial news, Blue Origin. Blue Origin performed the 11th successful test flight of its new Shepard suborbital vehicle last week. The vehicle, carrying 38 microgravity research payloads, lifted off from the company's West Texas test site. The crew capsule landed 10 minutes later after achieving a peak altitude of nearly 106 kilometres. The company confirmed previous statements that it still plans to start flying people later this year and that the capsule, designed for crewed flights, is in the barn at its Texas test site. Meanwhile, Blue Origin is adding to its footprint in its hometown. The company is building a facility across the street from its current factory and headquarters in the Seattle suburb of Kent, Washington, that will include 230,000 square feet of warehouse space and 100,000 square feet of offices. The company didn't disclose when it expected the new facility to be complete. The company is also building a factory in Alabama, for producing BE4 engines and recently proposed to expand a just completed factory in Florida for its new Glenn rocket. Michael. Thank you, Angelo. And finally tonight, moving back to New Zealand, a set of stamps in New Zealand honouring people involved in space science and exploration will contain a little something extra. The New Zealand Space Pioneers stamp set released by the country's Postal Service to mark the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 
honours people like William Pickering, the New Zealand native who served as director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The stamps, the Postal Service said, are sprinkled with real stardust collected from a meteorite found in Morocco. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. Thank you, Angelo. Thank you, Tina. And it's back to you, Andrew. Andrew.